Okay, uh, good morning and very welcome to you to join our panel. Uh, let me introduce myself and uh, also be here by it. My name is Ari Subakti and I'm a lecturer in Department of History in International Himala. Uh, okay, yes. Uh, our panel is uh, uh, the title of our panel is Are We There Yet? The Colonization of Indonesian Higher Education, uh, and we we will discuss about uh, our university, my university, uh, at university, Universitas uh, Negeri Malang, history and how uh, the Universitas Negeri Malang. Uh, try to in the process of decolonizing its curriculum, etc. So um, the process of decolonization, decolonization of knowledge in Indonesia after uh, independence is uh, influenced by uh, the spirit or antithesis of colonialism. So. Uh, Mr. Muhammad Yamin stated that uh, we have to make a national system of education. So we create a PTPG or Perguruan Tinggi, Pendidikan Guru or uh, College for Teacher uh, in Indonesia. Uh, in the process of decolonizing the college, uh, there is uh, many experience, there is many uh, dynamic uh, that is the story of the, uh, the Cas Paris, our the, the, the first head of the Department of History in Universitas Negeri Malang. Uh, that uh, uh, Pak Cas Paris is uh, born in Dutch, yeah, and then become an epigraph in Jawatan Kepur Tatalaan or in in Dutch language. We call it Audi <laughs> uh, and then uh, he became a professor of Sanskrit and old Indonesian history in Universitas Malang. But in 1958, uh, in some case, uh, he, he left the country, left Indonesia with his family, and yeah, this this uh, story. Coin as a uh, provoke us to to questioning what uh, what is the really mean of decolonize 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 decolonizing of higher education in Indonesia. So uh, the presenter of this panel is Professor Haryono, uh, a political history. A professor of political history at the Universitas Negeri Malang, Indonesia. Uh, some of his work are about the application of Stat Van Orlov and Belek, or SOP, State of War in Indonesia, and uh, intellectual history of the Indonesian founding fathers and the application of historical learning. And the second speaker is Indawa Yupuji Utami. She is an assistant professor of history education at the history department, Universitas Negeri Malang. She obtained her PhD in 2023 from the National Institute of Education, Nanyang Technological University of Singapore. Uh, after uh, she graduated, she actively contributed to education in Indonesia by writing history textbook for high school that advocate multi perspectivity uh, and published by the Indonesian Ministry of Education and this book are available in print digital and audio format for free. So uh, and our discussion here is Pak Agus Wignyo. Uh, Pak Agus Wignyo currently is an assistant professor in history at Gajah Mada University Yogyakarta and uh this wrote uh his uh research more about the uh history of education in indonesia and uh 
uh, another discussion with Bloomberg, Professor of Heritage and Postcolonial Studies in Indonesian History at the Institute for History and the Royal Netherlands Institute of Southeast Asian and Arabian Studies. So, um, can we present the first uh, first presentation? Yeah, for yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. My name Ariono. I will present it for decolonization of Indonesian higher education with the Ken Kadi our institution. PTPK and then to the Institute of Training for College and then in, in 1999 to be a Komitas Negeri Malang, the State University of Malang. Okay. And why I interest with this topic because in history we know Indonesian centuries or Netherlands centuries. This concept not only emerged in the Indonesian, but also in many countries, like in our friend from Filipino, Fernando, gave information to us that Indonesian centuries and Fernando centuries were very interesting for Korean in Filipino. But because he compared why Indonesian can make a uh, nation without parity with the culture, but Philippines to be Filipinos, but they parity with the culture. So Philippines more close with Spain than Indonesia with regards uh, or Indonesia. So. Today, I will present it about our institution was built or established in 1954 of the Round Table Conference. And then we can to discuss together to understand the process, decolonize knowledge, especially the independent, also. In the common people still have emotion anti Nedla, anti Blanda, or Amelu Rondo. But in the case of our institution, there are still many lectures in our department, not only Kasparis, but also several lecturers from Nedla and the local lecturer like Mr. Pitono and Twito, he he, he have a CSD program from Netherlands too. So I'll talk Mr. Yamin in the opening our institution had that our revolution it start with bravery and the same bravery we start development education in Indonesia or in Malang City, especially on East Java called Bodoneka. So the bravery is very first, very strong. We thought the other facility like uh, financial or infrastructure. So our institution, while was still have a building, so for the senior high school building to start. And then we have a lecture show many, many intellectuals from other parts, not only from East Java, but all Indonesian and the Netherlands, all to support our institution and then looking for loan from the others and support from the local government and local government gave land to our campus in, in the site no in the New York and right now called in Jalan Semarang and then the building support 
by Ford Foundation. Yeah. By the way, it's very interesting the lead of the rector of PTPK. The first is Mr. Adam Bakhtia, the father of Harsa Bakhtia. Adam Bakhtia was a head of the Taman Siswa School. He had master from United States. And then very interesting is Mr. Kuntoro Popo Pranoto, Dean of FKIP, in the, in the time in PTPK part of UNER, Universitas Erlangga from 1958 to 90. It is very interesting because he was the chairman of Chong Chafa, the last chairman, and the first chairman of Indonesia Muda, the young Indonesian and organization. And then until our rector, Mr. Professor Muhammad Iksan, they were a nationalist figure. Mr. Iksan, Professor Iksan, is a, a student colleague, and then he continued his study in Kajamada and then take master in Yonipo. So most of our rector not from the Dutch <laughs> influence, but from the United States. This is very interesting to us because after uh, in the, our independent, they have many, many problems. The first is we still have feudal value in our country, not only in our institution, because until right now, uh, feudal value still live in our country. So although we want to make decolonize, but we can autonom because our competence and our attitude, especially to the others and to the student, is very, very unequal. But in the common value, we want to be national education as antithesis to colonial system. In the colonial system, education eh, is discriminative and not equal. Not only among our inhabitants, but also with other ethnic. So any several school based ethnic like Sekolah Tina or based of religion, Sekolah Catholic, Sekolah Islam. But in the past, especially well in the colonial system, is well, Europe school, then what is meaning is so our stock is uh, Asia, like, like China, China, Chinese, Arab, and India. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Timur Timur Asing, yes. Until, right, uh, just because the Pribumi in London, no facility. So only Taman Siswa and the other school give information. So our institution, especially PTPK and EKIP, how to give chance at all of the students from Indonesia can learn in our institution. So the colonization in the first time is how to give us all of people to break a lecture or education in our institution. And then 
<laughs> we get, we know that the problem have many many faith in our country like the first is feudalism inherited from the local culture and then right now we still know the second is influence of the colonial education the third is in sufficient state financial the fourth is the lack of well-established intellectual class and maybe the very very important economic and geopolitical aspect especially after second war because the united states and usr only soviet is competent how to influence the other country include our country according to ignas little uh, to show up from indonesia the transformation of our country from traditional society to modern society is caused by strong domination of feudal mentality among Indonesia, both in elite and common people. The elite of Indonesia is led to tend fall into authoritarian, authoritarian behavior towards those below them while lacking confidence in faith of global economy. It is, it is a paradox in science and technology because science only can develop with the openness and equality and transparency so consequence of this education system plays little value of the process of dialogue with good otherwise enlightened and empowering students but commonly many indonesian university are authoritarianism not only in the classroom but only in the policy and the others. Ladies and gentlemen, as we see from the illustrator, our early, early division of level school system inherited from the colonial system. We have relied that education, colonial system, included the system of discrimination among indigenous people and foreign people put from it. The Christian school, Muhammad Yamin, as Minister of Education in early 50s, state, during colonial area, area educational, educational access in Indonesia was divided based on race and social hierarchy. The system favored individual of noble system of priorities of mixing skill over the holistic development individual of human being. The objective of Indonesian national education system following independence was to establish an antithesis the colonial education model. But since 1950, the offering goal was to create a national education system that promoted equality, inclusivity, and non-discriminatory access to education. Ironically, some of the negative practices inherited from colonial education persisted in certain aspects of the national education system. The third factor, the third major challenge was the upward lack of funding necessary to rebuild and expand Indonesian educational infrastructure following independence. In early 1950, the education budget constitute only around five 0.5 percent from the national budget. The Minister of Education Muhammad Yamin proposed that the government allocated between 24 until 40 percent of the national budget, but he filed to agree by parliament. In 1952, the government budget increased by nearly 20. 200 million rupiah, facilitating the office of over 300 new educational institutions. However, by 1954, despite another significant significant rise in the number of education institutions following the temporary decline, the budget allocated to the Ministry of Education was part of the reduced. The, the budget has likely reflect, reflect the accepting national priorities and product. Uh, consider the 
question arise: how did the government address this critical issue insufficient funding for Indonesian educational infrastructure in this time? America more give loan to Indonesia than the Netherlands because after Second World, the Netherlands still uh, have difficulty in financial, but United States and give with like what is that? Yeah, yeah, sir. Each each not 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 yet. Each uh, each not paid yet because it is in in take like uh, what is meaning it in for our port foundation port foundation. So many our lecture in our campus is continue study in United States then to the Netherlands. And our lecture less is can to continue study to the Netherlands because in nineteen fifty six until nineteen fifty seven Castus Irian Barat. So it's it make an uh what's meaning is nationally trusty. So many many gas uh, to export from Indonesia. Emotion elite and common people to the Netherlands is very high. And then so the guns to looking um, cooperate with Netherlands is was decreased. The detent gentlemen and the initial years of our institution we have like funding so our institution decide to put it by local government <coughs> by for foundation and so there are many 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 our friends and, and our senior like Patricio Putro then to be a rector he continue study in unity then and then but the situation is no more leisure for our lecture because in 1960 there were many many our lecture study not only to United States but also to China, Russia, Romania and other socialist socialist. But after the 1965 fair, they cannot come back and our government new order <coughs> it, it was supported to continue related with United States. Also after 1960 EKKE was established headed by the Netherlands, but the influence of United States is more powerful than the other country. So the colonized not only can perish from <coughs> Netherlands, but in Indonesia, in our institution, is more close to the United States. The next issue, uh, but the topic of Indonesian intellectual class uh, is combined with the revolutionary response. Government not only focused on repairing, comforting, and constructing school building, but also keep collective and self response on the revolutionary young. In outline of government regulation number eight of 1949, later expanded by regulation number 32 of 1949. This regulation provided have born scholarship to students who had served and participated in the war between 1945 until 1960. Another practical measure to address this challenge was the recruitment of foreign kids, particularly at the university 
level. So in 1955 and 1966, Indonesian university employed approximately 250 foreign teaching staff. The largest group consists of 50 Dutch lecture, followed by 13 from Britain and the others. And United still in 1955 and 1960 is small, only seven. Additionally, smaller number of lecture came from India, Yugoslavia, Australia, and the others. Just can still relax. This lecture in 1950 also resulted of phenomena of Trojan Terbang, literary translate, uh, flying lecture. It not only gave lecture in <coughs> one campus, but also gave more than two campus. We are trying to do it with this is more than one university. In overcoming this challenge, the government tried to provide more lecture by recruiting those who just graduated from the existing university. Additional government also send students and lecture to study overseas, including to Netherlands. But as I argue, continue from colonial day in education. Apart from Netherlands, many Indonesian university lecture were sent to USA with the assistance from the fourth foundation. And then the US influence in Indonesia, higher education, facilitated, and more powerful than compared to the others. Nevertheless, not all of our lecture go mainly passive receive of Western influence just because they were educated of the Even though they were educated in the USA or Europe, many of them died from this knowledge to sweet and solve the problem in Indonesian context. For example, combining the educational philosophy of Kiaja Wantoro and her training overseas to Partina Paka, uh, one of our senior, uh, founded a laboratorium school in Malang in 1968. This school encouraged teachers to move from mainly transfer of knowledge into preparing their students to be a good citizen and value local culture as well as national values. He also introduced a discipline freedom derived from Kiyada Vivantoro, freedom of learning at that school. Students were given freedom to choose their learning activities and regulate their own ways of learning. Additionally, Professor Bakasi also wrote a number back to for elementary school with better suite with the, our culture. Ladies and gentlemen, in Indonesian anti death sentiment, was one thing to dream up in the following sentence about Indian Barat and national identity. Our first head of Department of History, Johannes Hispertus de Casparis, will be one of the story of this situation. In 1968, he expelled from our campus and he moved to London and so on. Before I <coughs> closing my presentation, I give information that PTPK and then IKIP and then UM, Untar Negeri Malang, maybe can example of the challenge with the Indian colonization of knowledge by Indonesian people. Minister LA, the institution so to break free from the legacy of the Dutch knowledge system, I mean to construct of Indonesian centric educational framework as an antithesis to the colonial education. However, despite the recognition of Indonesian uh, independence, that influence in the educational sector remains significant. Over time, attention with the Dutch escalated particularly to two West Asian conflicts that influence gradually decreased. This diminishing influence was replaced by the <laughs> other country, notably the Swiss Socialist ideology, the USF, as well as the United States. Following the event of 1965, the 
influence of socialist country increase and intellectual opulent American dominion was strength. The Americanization extended in various fields, especially in education. To conclude my presentation, we are still have not there yet the colonies size of our education according to our bonding party three. So through um, the discussion, I want to, to I want to advise or criticize from all of you. Thank you a lot for your attention. So I want to wrap up the uh, implication of the, the what, uh, implication of decolonizing uh, knowledge in higher education uh, is a process that remains uh, convoluted. Uh, uh, many paradox, many, many problems, uh, how uh, Indonesian people, how curriculum of uh, higher education uh, left the colonial uh, influence, but uh, they, because of many problems, uh, simply go to another influence. In this uh, case, is uh, maybe for foundation or American influence like that. And uh, Pahar uh, focus on the fail of this process not not the fail not absolute uh, absolutely fail but uh the process is uh remain uh difficult because of uh, the mentality of indonesian people uh such as a uh, feudalism who diminish from colonial uh colonial people uh such as uh, european dutch or france or england who come to Indonesia, they uh, not bring feudalism to their country. They just uh, left it in Indonesia. But Indonesian people uh, still what, they inherited it from uh, colonial culture, from local culture, Japanese culture, for example. And then uh, uh, in higher education, leaving it embedded in, in everyday life of our, our universities so to wrap up like that and uh, the second speaker uh, who in the Wahyu will talk about uh, in the global context uh, why the decoloniality uh, uh, is still difficult in Indonesia but maybe in another country so time is yours Thank you, uh, Masarif. Uh, yeah. So, can everyone hear me? Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, yeah. So, um, thank you uh, very much, everyone. Good morning over there and um, good afternoon from Indonesia. Uh, in this session, I want to present uh, something that I call decoloniality in Indonesian. Um, Coloniality or decoloniality in Indonesia's uh, higher education ranking systems. So to start with, um, okay. So this is the agenda that I want to uh, that I want to talk about about the global context, and then I'll talk about the Indonesia's uh, higher education institution KPI leak, uh, key performance index, and also I will tackle into the coloniality or decoloniality in the ranking system. And also um, um, after that, I will ask uh, you to join me in imag imagining the possibilities on how to tackle this problem together. So uh, this, uh, this is the news from last year, uh, University of uh, Utrecht University. Um, uh, decided not to participate in the THA ranking, um, which is one of the global university ranking system. And um, that was uh, considered to be a bold move. A lot of um, 
publications in Indonesia talk about that, uh, especially in the newspapers. And while uh, Utrecht can do that, but perhaps not many Indonesian uh, universities can follow these steps. Uh, in fact, when I go back, after I finished my PhD in Singapore, and then I went back to Indonesia, and then I worked to uh, back in my university, this is, uh, sorry, uh, I, I face that there's a very huge problem with the ranking systems in Indonesia, where our performance was uh, monitored every month in my university. So basically, this presentation stem up from my anxiety and also frustration um, of the uh, ranking system in my university, which is uh, also related to the bigger problem of uh, ranking system in Indonesia and also in the global context. So uh, let's move to the next context. So uh, where are the world best universities located? This is from the uh, publication from Nasri Ansari and McCoy uh, last year. What was what is considered as the world best universities? Mostly they are located in the global north, especially in the US and the UK. While uh, as you can see here, while um, not so much in Africa or or Asia uh, and other places. And many scholars accuse that uh, this global university ranking is instrument of colonization. So this is a new colonization. So the, the colonizer, they do not necessarily need to come to one nation and then build their colony over there, but they can colonize other places uh, in the global south, including in Indonesia, by using this instrument of global ranking system. And this uh, ranking system mostly benefit uh, big universities, especially those in the global north, uh, because they have uh, better standing, they have better funding compared to we are in the global south. For example, uh, for scholars like me or Arif or or Pak Rektor even, it's, it's uh, not easy for us to get access to uh, articles in journals because of a lot of journals, reputable journals are with paywall or even if we want to publish several journals uh, charts, ha very high article publication charts. So while these publications become an important indicator for those global ranking, uh, global university ranking. So there's, there's a problem here and Therefore, um, it is also considered as uh, reinforcing a colonial hierarchy between the global north and uh, global south. So there are a lot of uh, efforts to call for more inclusive metrics uh, in Asia, in Africa, and other places. So this is, uh, and of course, in Indonesia, we want to tackle this problem. So this is the comparison between the several uh, global university rankings and Indonesia. Okay, we are not merely follow that, but we adapt and, and make uh, several changes that by the government considered to, you know, more suitable with our context. So uh, compared to other uh, global university rankings, uh, the one that under the KPI, the KPI league, that's what we have in Indonesia. So there are eight uh, criteria and some of them might correspond with the indicator from global university ranking system, but some are not. And unlike the global university ranking system, which put several um, presentations, uh, KPI league uh, does not do that. But uh, every criteria has some sub criteria and everything has its points, but there's no presentation on which one considered uh, the most important among others. Uh, why, uh, as I mentioned, when he, uh, Utrecht University uh, declared that they did, they do not want to join the 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 <coughs> they do not want to participate in the THA uh, ranking. Uh, there are a lot of uh, response from Indonesia, and one of them is that we cannot 
uh, do that because in Indonesia, we need to hold universities accountable for what they do. Because for many years, uh, at least um, during the new order and previously, uh, there's no clear instrument on how to hold universities accountable on what they do. And that uh, the KPI is one of the instrument to do that. That's, that's the argument. And uh, as I mentioned, it does not merely uh, adopt, but there's also some adaptation on the global universities criteria. And it terrified from, con uh, and, and then um, the KPI was formulated in the national level. And then uh, the rector, from public universities signed the contract with the Ministry of Education on uh, on their KPIs. There are three main guiding principles on the KPI league in Indonesia, as mentioned in the 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 uh, their publication, uh, their published books on methodology and everything. Uh, the first thing is the relevance to industry, business, and workforce. And the second one is the freedom in choosing the area of excellence. For example, uh, if let's say a university want to focus on on the first or second or, or even uh, the third KPI, they can choose to 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 uh, to push their excellence in that area, and it's not necessary. They they don't really have to to pursue all those criteria and uh, focus on pursuing the most important changes that uh, the university one university want that's that's the the guiding principle that's the idea but we know that it's not always like that in the in the in the practice in the implementation and <clears throat> this is the kpi league in indonesia so there are this is the the one in 2020 but starting last year there are one more criteria of of universities so the first one is the the uh, ptnbh is the sort of highest ranking highest types of university with more freedom uh, and then the the second one is the ptnblu that's the second level of university and the third one is ptn satkar and the the last one is um big universities which, fo which focus on arts that's the the new the new one in 2023. So, what's the implication of this university ranking to Indonesian public uh, universities? So, it affects their uh, funding. So, those who are in the especially in the top ten receive more financial incentives from the Ministry of Education, Culture, Research, and Technology compared to the others. So, if let's say uh, for example, last year, the, the winner of this KPI league in the PTNBH is, is UNESA, if I'm not mistaken. Then UNESA received uh, a lot of fundings from, from the Ministry of Education, while other universities like my university is not that much. And then, um, so there's correlation between this ranking and funding. Uh, that's why a lot of Indonesian universities uh, try to win this league, this race. Um, so while this system uh, provide an alternative approach to university ranking system, as, uh, for example, like different leagues for different types of universities, different criteria, and etc., it works, uh, the, the underlying logic uh, that works within the Indonesian KPI leagues is, I think it's just the same with those in the global university ranking, uh, which um, we can always uh, argue uh, or debate on what is quality that is uh, being discussed here, what is considered the, the high quality education. And it also foster competition among universities and as i uh, as i show you in the in the case of fundings it's also create injustice because those who can uh, universities that become in the top 10 uh, usually there are big they already a big universities with a big resource funding and and then those universities receive more money while those who are in the bottom 20% bottom, 
they most of them are small universities with uh, small fundings but they cannot receive more funding from the government to support them to be uh, to achieve a higher quality of education so that's that's uh, also create gaps in in universities and also create injustice within uh, indonesian universities so in my last uh, yeah no yeah perhaps this is my last slide so i want to ask you to imagining uh, possibilities what can be done to is there any ways to redefine indonesia's higher education institutions uh, quality and can we move uh, to gotong royong or uh, collaboration uh, instead of competition and i want to uh, use the arguments of uh, one of the arguments from from pa uh, agus wignos uh, article i think uh, university should focus more on social oriented activities so can we count this into uh, our ranking systems uh, because I think it's also important to ask these questions in Indonesia uh, because we need to if, if we keep doing this I don't know how long we can we can continue uh, doing this and and as shown in uh, several news there are a lot of practice of uh, um cheating in so that universities can produce more publications and and also uh forcing students to 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 publish and etc etc which is not really good uh in our uh in our education systems that we actually want to do better uh, after indonesian independence and also because our lecturers were so busy in raising feeding the ranking systems this is what the indonesian uh, lecturers uh, look like i mean this is very popular meme in indonesia so if you are indonesian uh, university lecturer then you have to do the teaching the research, uh, community service you need to fill out a lot of uh, forms systems and so on and so on to fit those university ranking system. So I think we need to do something better. So uh, we can, we as lecturer also can uh, do much more uh, service to our community instead of focusing on raising to be the best in the Indonesian KPI league. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, Mbak Indah, uh, who uh, Indah Wahyu bring us to uh, redefine the higher education uh, indicator, or maybe uh, uh, bring uh, bring us to redefine the meaning of decolonizing of higher education, decolonizing of knowledge. So. Uh, uh, we move to uh, the discussion. You or yeah. 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 Maybe right here. You can, you, you can take a seat here. Another participant, only participant can see. Hey, um, am I speaking loud enough? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you for um, inviting me and uh, for um, interesting panel on a topic that is very close to my interest. Um, yeah, uh, the, these are two, uh, at first sight, very different presentations, but there is, uh, there is a clear connection uh, because they also both address um, yeah, so structures of uh, academia, and uh, structures in the way uh, academia is organized. Um, so one one very general question um, in connection to both, uh, but maybe more important to yeah. yours, yes. is also the question that you uh, address uh, yourself as well. Um, 
how or, or to what extent is it possible to to decolonize um, academia uh, when um, the structures of, of academia and the frameworks uh, the way the disciplines and um, research and education are um, still well, are um, it's, uh, directed yes. by well, uh, Western centered yes. uh, academic, academic uh, knowledge. Mm -hmm. So, for example, in, in your um, presentation, yes. uh, you um, referred to some of the challenges in, in well, in developing uh, an, uh, an academic institute that is also actually geared towards uh, teaching. Um, the, the existence of intellectual capacity, the existence of what was named, or you named it as well, so uh, a local feudal culture. Um, Uh, without questioning uh, also what is local, what is what is local about that? Is, um, is that future culture maybe also very much entangled with the ways um, academia is being built up? Has it something to do with more with patriarchy than local Japanese feudal culture? Um, so, um, You also talk about decolonizing knowledge, uh, and I think part of uh, researching uh, in, in uh, the colonial dimension, both colonial yeah. um both in in Europe, yeah. in the Netherlands, as in Indonesia, it, it should also entail uh, a yeah. how the different disciplines are are being shaped. Um, uh, and it's that is as much to do with personal yeah. and, and structures of the past, but it's also as much to do about how these different disciplines uh, work. Yeah. And would it be possible to see in, in the various um, disciplines from agricultural studies, yes. uh, where um, now this is working on that, uh, to that in this in this in this in how did research work in practice? What was the role of uh, Indonesians in um, contributing to academic knowledge production, um, also in colonial times already, um, and the kind of forms of knowledge that we don't recognize at first sight because we are trained to deal with the results, uh, the problems that are being taught at the university. Uh, maybe the kind of colonial knowledge that, that we think is colonial has much more local knowledge in it. Um, and the other way around, uh, our ideas about local knowledge um, may blind us about the colonial frames or the colonial yeah. input, colonial role in shaping uh, local knowledge. So that was, uh, I think, my, my main uh, general comments. So, uh, uh, um, yeah, um, a suggestion yeah. to also zoom in on on on, which, uh, on knowledge production and uh, focus on exchange. Look at the hierarchies uh, and see how they also often change. How the Casparas, for example, was very much dependent on. Uh, local actors who know okay, inscriptions or the language or um, um, yeah another thing is uh, of course but you mentioned that but um, the, the the challenge to be colonized um, in a time when new colonial uh, partners step in uh, and not only after the sixty five but before. Uh, the U.S. played a huge role. Um, 
Yeah, and you know, the, 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 this, uh, yeah, would we'll be interested to hear more about um, uh, the table you have about foreign lecturers also um, in Indonesian studying abroad. You can still see that particular disciplines uh, are um, sought after uh, still more in the Netherlands than elsewhere. And, and why would that be the case? Um, yeah, and I think so. Maybe also as a um, very general reaction uh, more, uh, to Inda's presentation, I think this this uh, focus on, on rating systems, uh, etc. Um, this is as, as very much of what we actually should be looking at. What what in, uh, scholars are actually. Or academics are actually supposed to do, and that is to do critical independent research, teaching about it. And so it, it's not too much about quantity. I don't think that competition is a problem. Is, is, is a problem. I don't think that that um, or to just suppose the competition vis a vis Gotum Goyong. I mean, I, I do believe that we need to collaborate more, especially if we want to decolonize practices of. Uh, academic knowledge production, um, but um, yeah, uh, we have a moral, the, the moral uh, obligation to, to to do good independent research and teaching is and and uh, when requested or when needed, um, use that also for society. Um, is, is more important than uh, focusing on problems or uh, uh, of rating and of the whole rating of system. But this is where I yeah. leave it. Um, and I'm, I apologize, I have okay. to leave earlier. Yeah. I thought this would stop at 11. Yeah, yeah. thank you, Marika. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your. <laughs> Because of our time very tight, uh, Pak Agus, time is your. Uh, Pak Agus, Hello. yes, uh, yes, I can hear you. Okay. Hello. 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 Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you, Mas Arif, and very good morning to you, uh, Bro Suaryono, Marike, Mas Arif, and everyone. Of you there in Leiden, very good morning, very good afternoon from Jogja, and very warm welcome in the warm uh, afternoon in the real sense. It's going to rain now, and uh, I am uh, enjoying the talk by Professor Suaryono because it reminds me at the uh, at the beginning of the so-called uh, Institute of Teacher Training in Indonesia and how. Uh, primary and secondary school teachers were trained and the institutions uh, uh, in discussion was the so-called institute for higher learning for teacher training the uh, perguruan tinggi pendidikan guru which uh, came into being as a first uh, higher uh, institution uh, for uh, teacher training in indonesia and uh, it is quite hard to talk about decolonization when we uh, are talking about uh, the establishment of education system in uh, in the context of 1950s in Indonesia because uh, technically all intellectual elites all of those who were uh, uh, professionally competent enough to be in higher education or in the education sectors uh, were um, uh educated had received education from the colonial system so including those who then uh uh, uh serve as the first uh management or managers top managers in the teachers training uh with the case of malang i am very much uh, or specifically interested in the in the fact that uh uh uh, the American influence in the establishment of Malang uh, Teachers Institute 
uh, was uh, taking place uh, at the shadow of Dutch Dutch influences. Okay, and then uh, and in this sense, uh, the the person uh, the persons and the personnel that in the, in the pictures that uh, Professor Suharyono uh, presented uh, all of the background in the Dutch education. Although they didn't uh, pursue higher education in the Netherlands, but in the United States mostly, they got their uh, earlier education uh, experiences uh, under the Dutch system. So in the first rector of Malang, that is uh, Adam Bakhtiar, was a graduate of Holandsko uh, School in Yogyakarta. Also, uh, Professor Sam Suri also came from uh, Holandsko Quick School in Jakarta, whom I got uh, the chance to uh, to interview uh, a couple of years ago, and it's very interesting to know that. And then also when the American uh, professor came to Malang for the uh, uh, re, re, reform of uh, the education system, there uh, there was still uh, uh, many you know signs of the Dutch education uh, uh, in place. The laboratory was still in the setting of uh, the uh, Dutch style with a lot of equipments from the Netherlands. Also, a book and the textbooks also came from the Netherlands. And there were a fewer people who could speak uh, English rather than those who could speak Dutch. Uh, and uh, language uh, was a very uh, important medium in the, uh, of us, uh, also very important indicator of the so-called decolonization. So, so in this sense, I share the uh, argument of, uh, of Marika that perhaps we missed to discuss what it is meant by uh, decolonizing knowledge. When we are talking about colonial knowledge, we sometimes forget what is it, uh, what is it precisely. Uh, was it the knowledge that was produced by colonial institutions? Or uh, wa was it the knowledge that was produced in the patterns of colonial uh, colonial style, or uh, whether it was the knowledge that was used as instrument of colonialism? That's and that's uh, these three uh, uh, points are different points uh, uh, to understand what uh, colonial knowledge uh, would have meant uh, uh, in this sense, right? and and I think. Uh, changes in the institutional uh, uh, aspects uh, are only one thing of indicator, one only uh, indicating uh, uh, the process of decolonization. However, uh, the process of knowledge production, also the use of knowledge, uh, would be some other you know indicators, very important indicators whether. Uh, uh, there has been uh, uh, decolonization in, the, in, 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 in higher education in Indonesia. So institutions, of course, uh, are important to study, but then uh, the process of knowledge production uh, is also very, very important to, mm -hmm. to explore further whether uh, there is a decolonization system. And the next level would be in the use, the purpose of knowledge being produced by the institutions uh, uh, whether to serve uh, the idea of decolonizing society or, or even to reproduce another type of colonialism. And this point would relate to uh, uh, the presentation by uh, 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 you know, by, by Inga uh, in the current, current you know, uh, in the current practice of higher education, that is the ranking system. Um, and I was questioning whether the rank system uh, of universities would uh, reflect also a type of, uh, of decoloniality or it is still under the umbrella of colonialism, coloniality. And uh, Indah was uh, pointing to the Indonesian system of uh, university ranking that is the KPI as a, a type of, you know, a, a decolonizing process of higher education. But I, I don't agree to that. <laughs> if you, I don't think I agree to that point because if you see really in a, a close look 
at the uh, at the KPI uh, mechanism of of determining what good or bad quality of of higher education, then you can see still exactly in the same pattern of those other rank systems at the international world. You know, whether it is the W uh, WUR or or QS or those other system, okay, and also in the uh, model of journal indexation, the academic in, uh, and the indexation of academic journals uh, <laughs> clearly uh, sh uh, shows also a pattern of you know uh, dominations of knowledge production in the, on the one sense. Okay, so in both cases, in both presentations, I missed to uh, listen to the idea of community service uh, that is pengabdian masyarakat in the indonesian uh, word uh, as as a clear clear you know um uh, clear point that was meant to recognize the indonesian higher education so uh, for the broader audience maybe it is important to mention that the indonesian higher education had threefold mission that is teaching research and community service and it is very clear from the statement of president sukarno and minister muhammad yamin back in the 50s that the the new indonesia was to establish its own education system it is not just an education system but uh, an education system that has to be indonesian and in character Indonesian in purpose, Indonesian in nature. And this nature of being Indonesian higher education was defined by uh, Professor Sarjiton, the first president of Gajah Mada University, by Mr. Supomo, by, uh, by uh, uh, the, the president of Erlangga University, I forgot the name, and by Muhammad Yamin, by Sukarno, by Muhammad Hatta, and those many people defined the this Indonesian nature of higher education uh, was that it has to serve the interest of the people. So the university of the people, Universitas Rakyat or Universitas Kerakyatan, that is the Indonesian uh, uh, nature of uh, higher education system that those founding fathers uh, meant to, uh, to establish and that, that is meant to decolonize the, uh, the remnants of uh, colonialism. So it was not just uh, to depart from uh, the Dutch legacy, no, and not just to embrace a new, uh, a new, you know, a model of higher education system, the American model, but it was to, you know, to create something very new, in the sense that uh, the purpose of higher education system should, should, you know, should serve the interests of the people of the Indonesian people and. Uh, the community service was created as a mechanism to you know to to uh, to deploy this uh, colonial you know uh, characteristic uh, 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 into more Indonesian style of uh, system. But as we see, I uh, um, share with your point that maybe after all these years, we can see still uh, uh, the Indonesian higher education system. Uh, so much embrace uh, uh, this different, you know, style of rankings and also uh, trajectories that maybe not uh, so connected to the needs and the problems of uh, the Indonesian society uh, uh, at the ground, yeah, on the ground, and then and that's the problem, and maybe problems of decolonialism uh, rely not uh, not. On the on the aspect whether it is Dutch oriented, American oriented, but uh, whether the knowledge being produced uh, is used uh, for the purpose to serve uh, uh, the people of Indonesia and the, and the social problem of of the people in Indonesia, and that's I, I what I can see from what decolonization uh, in this sense. Maybe I should leave uh, my point in that uh, stage and uh, really. I really appreciate the uh, the talks today, and I learned quite a lot from from uh, both presenters. Thank you. Thank you, Pak. Uh, to tell to you that uh, the five.
<laughs> only uh, the, the time only five minutes left and what do we do with five minutes? <laughs> uh, maybe uh, one question or yeah, it's okay. Okay, one or two question. Yeah. Maybe I send us a bit closer to the microphone so that yeah. okay, the yeah. line can hear me. Yeah. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm Peter Pantal. I'm director from Mythic Southeast Asia, and I'm co-organizing winner. And as organizer, you're supposed to be restrained, but I'm too energized by this session <laughs> to keep my mouth shut. So sorry, allow me. Um, thank you very much to the whole panel. Uh, Professor Haryono, you know, unpacks a bit how the Dutch influence were present in the 50s and 60s and so on. Inda did, uh, I think, a great presentation showing, you know, how uncomfortable we are with the international rankings. And I appreciated also Paagu's comments uh, further to that. Um, now, what struck me, because the theme is, you know, decolonizing knowledge and in Professor Haryonov's introduction, you can see that link between the colonial period and what happens in the 50s and the 60s. However, if I listen to Bainer's presentation and how uncomfortable she is with the rankings, I feel like a representative from University of Leiden could also have made that presentation here this morning. Yeah. Because the rankings are methodologically questionable for everyone. You know, in whether you live in the north or in the south. So for me, you know, the, the decolonial frame in that sense doesn't really work. I mean, I totally appreciate everything she says. Um, and so I thought, you know, and in your presentation, you mentioned the very interesting example of Utrecht University, which I think deserves more attention, where a university says, we stop with this craziness. We do not collaborate with the commercial institutions that create these rankings. We get out of it. And, you know, many people are like, wow, you know, that's a business risk because you're no longer in the rankings. But I don't know, you know, winner is the Indonesian Dutch collaboration, which is has its own historical colonial history, wouldn't it be nice if Indonesia and the Netherlands universities agree to get out of the rankings, you know, as a, as a joint recommendation? Uh, that's just what I felt like sharing after listening to these wonderful presentations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay. Uh, that's all uh, for uh, this panel. I'm very sorry to uh, close this panel. So uh, maybe in uh, next time, maybe in uh, an, an informal uh, talk, we can uh, make some yeah continue discuss. And thank you again for your uh, coming to this panel. Thank you, Bagus. Thank you, everyone.